We are discussing about uh, chapter number six, manufacturing industries. Manufacturing industries or Vinirman Udyog. The story starts with a family. Here we have Harish, he is the kid, and uh, they are doing the Diwali shopping. So when he sees all the products, his father explained that the shoes, clothes, sugar that they are buying, they are made either in uh, large industries using you know big machines or utensils manufactured in small industries or diyas made by hand artisans in household industry. So what is the manufacturing? What is the industry? Whenever there is a raw material, now raw material is not useful to us. If I if I provide you bauxite you will not be able to appreciate it that much. But when some processing is done on this raw material and it is made as valuable product, valuable product, this is called manufacturing. Let me tell you again, the production of goods in large quantities after processing from raw materials to more value, valuable products, this is called manufacturing. Like paper, we make it from where? Wood. Sugar from sugar cane. Iron and steel from iron ore and aluminium from bauxite. So all these things, clothes also. Various people are employed in these secondary activities. Secondary. Now what is the primary activity which is related to, in our country it is related to the agriculture. But around, along with this, various secondary activities Manufacturing is the main, that is the primary material into finished goods. People are employed in the secondary activities. Like the steel factories, people are employed in steel factories, car, breweries, textile industries, bakeries. They fall into this secondary category. Right? So one more important thing is that the economic strength, economic strength of any country is measured by what? That the country is economically strong, it is economically good, it is economically developing. That means this all things comes when we see the development of manufacturing industries. If the manufacturing industries are good, the health of manufacturing industries are good, then we say that this country has a good economic strength. So now it comes, what is the importance of manufacturing? Why do we require, why we are discussing about manufacturing? So manufacturing helps in modernizing the agriculture. The agriculture, what we are doing is a, a form, we, you can say it is the backbone of our economy, agriculture. And manufacturing changes it, it is changing it because most of the dependency on the agriculture which we, our people have, now we have manufacturing and because agriculture is being modernized, so these all modernization is helping the other people also to, to have a different job or secondary or tertiary sector, they get a job. Then it provides employment opportunities to, opportunities to different people. There are different, different disparities, you know, different areas, regimes where the people can find job and thereby they are getting uh, employment. So, they are not uh, unemployed, manufacturing is eradicating unemployment and poverty from our country. This is how because the people are getting job. So, the unemployment and poverty from our country is if you have good industry, manufacturing industries, then this can be avoided or eradicated. Second thing comes or third thing comes, this is the third one, increase in the country's income by exporting manufactured goods. If you are making good stuff, quality stuff, and if you are sending it to some country, say, you know, any country, then this country, maybe it may be a developed country, it will give you in dollars, in uh, say in pound. So you get a very good bargain. You, you are bringing the by manufacturing, you are bringing the foreign exchange into the country. This is how manufacturing becomes so important. It improves, improves the country's 
infrastructure this also is done by manufacturing and the countries that are transforming the raw materials into the furnished goods it is always seen that they are prosperous they are prosperous so it, in, it improves the level of the uh, country money of the country foreign exchange and the country infrastructure one thing is very important that when we talk about agriculture because this is our all you know what we do 60 percent of indian people are involved directly or indirectly into agriculture so if i talk about agriculture and if i talk about industry or manufacturing industry they all they are not exclusive because what are all the modernizing uh, modernization of agriculture is going on the product is coming from industry so the industry is giving good products to agriculture and this industry is getting the raw material for its production like crops different things from the agriculture for example industry is giving agriculture the fertilizers irrigation pump insecticide pesticide plastic and pvc pipes uh, the machines tools etc industry is providing the agriculture and uh, in uh, return the agro based industry they are getting the raw material from agriculture so they are not exclusive they are purak they are uh, like you know dependent on each other and they help both of them help each other so growth rate of say, the share of manufacturing sector in india gdp gdp is uh, you know this is our gross domestic uh, product product so gdp that is gdp decides what is the company grow, uh, country's growth okay so whatever gdp is doing gross domestic product this has many things which are affecting it gdp so manufacturing is about 17 percent but this number can change you have to google it because by the time i am telling you it may i might have changed so this is uh, the gdp uh, you you should have just idea this is 17 percent and the growth rate of manufacturing sector is around 11 percent per annum and this also keeps on changing but it remains somewhere like uh, this number what is the contribution of industry to national economy we just saw that uh, over the last two decades 17 percent it gives that is manufacturing sector is giving to the gdp gdp growth and out of this 27 percent for the industry which includes 10 percent uh, coming from mining quarrying electricity and gas and this is quite lower than other uh, you know prominent east asian economies which is around uh, their East Asian economies it's around 25 to 35 percent but we have seen that uh, it is around you know growth is 7 percent but we need at least 12 percent this has to be 12 percent for us to have a good growth now industrial location whenever we are discussing about an industry we need to have certain factors in, in our mind that where the factory is going to be what factory is going to be how it is being uh, it, it has to be executed or planned or it, it has to be established so there does there are certain factors we call them as industrial location whenever we talk about a location then the location of an industry it depends on certain factors that where we have to put this industry the first one is the availability of raw material because if the raw material is at east and you are putting the in the location of the industry in the west there is no point the availability of raw material should be very near to where we are or, or the transportation should be good if even if it is farther then there has to be direct uh, transport of getting the raw material from there then availability of cheap labor if you see the western countries the labor laws are quite strict so in canada you have to pay 14 dollars at least for one hour to anyone who is working devoid of what he is working in uh, us also 8 to 10 dollars you have to pay now this labor is quite cheap in india but if the skilled labor or non skilled labor are not near this uh, industry then who is going to work for the industry so we need the availability of cheap labor we know want labor and it has to be cheap also if you are paying this much amount maybe you know you'll not be benefited from the industries then availability of power and other infrastructure any industry which you talk about require power require energy require urja for that you need to have a proper infrastructure you will not be able to work or the company is not 
or the industry is not going to produce if the power or current went on coming going sometime it comes sometime it doesn't then the proximity to markets whatever raw materials or other supporting materials you want you need to get it from the market and whatever you have producing you are producing you have to transport it to the market so for that you need to have proximity to markets and availability of adequate and swift means of transportation whatever you are producing whatever you are getting or the labor is coming and there are so many things which are going on so they need transport and the land which we want here which we are making it should be easily available or cheaply available there has to be a capital that is the capital has to be put uh, there has to be someone to invest in your industry or you are investing in your in, uh, in the industry so all this factor let me just uh, go through it again that we need raw material we need power land transport labor capital and market for the industry uh, to call us or the industrial location to be a good location so coming to this one let me again tell you that the ideal location of an industry will always be the cost of obtaining the raw materials at site should be as minimum as possible the cost of distribution of production should be as as good as possible the decision to locate factory at a site that is what is the site the site the land the location is very important and the cost of production at site is very important these are the ideal location of an effect industry and these are the factors which affect it coming to industry market linkage what happens the money money is the the key factor it is it is being used it is being invested and in the in the industry so the inputs are raw materials and common component parts and the factors of production we need which we already talked about here is land we need a land labor cheap labor good labor skilled labor capital and entrepreneur and infrastructure when all these things are there the money is invested then the transport to the factory because the raw material or the people have to be transported or they will you know transport themselves to the factory in the factory now the final the raw material is converted into actual value added product like a mango would would come a mango would come a fruity will be produced a mango will come a juice will be produced that is the value addition we are doing from the raw material once this output product is there then it is being transported it is to be it has to be swift fast and uh, efficient reliable transport it goes to the market and from market it is sold and then we get the money again so this is how the chakra or you can say a cycle of industry market linkage in linkage goes in the pope in the pre independence period most of the industries were set up in mumbai kolkata chennai the reason was that they were near to the ports and most of them have now they they we know all these are now the mahanagars or the they are quite developed because the industrial development was the main key factor there now when we are talking about industries it becomes important for us to classify it because it depends on uh, from where the raw material is coming what is the role of the industry what is the capital and uh, who who has the ownership so all in this basis we can classify the industries so let me take you to this one so classification of industries uh, if the basis is from where the raw material is coming so the raw material may come from agro or agriculture or it may come from mineral mineral based when we talk about uh, agro based that is the raw material is coming from agriculture it is the, the industries will be cotton wool jute silk rubber sugar tea coffee all these are coming from agriculture they are being they are the produce they are you know coming from agriculture industries and when we talk of, about mineral base that is they are coming from mineral they are, are actually minerals so iron steel cement aluminium petrochemical industries they want the raw material as minerals so these are based on the uh, raw material so these are source of raw material and when we say role that is what is what kind of industry it is is it a basic industry or it is a consumer industry now basic industry means this industry is feeding to other industry 
let me tell you again that we have an industry here and we have an industry here now this industry is producing and it is giving the product to the other industry so we call this as a basic industry and when this entity say this is second industry now this industry is producing for us for the consumer so this industry will be consumer industry this will be basic industry this will be consumer industry so what we get here the basic industries are iron and steel copper smelting aluminium smelting so if you are doing smelting the copper will be sent to where the the user will not take copper directly like you and me we will not take aluminium directly we have to get some sheets we have to get in some form so that we can use it so now basic industry they are producing for the other industry and those industries which are actually producing for us we we eat sugar we want cosmetics we use paper we use something some machines so these are the industries consumer industries who are making it for us now coming to the capital what amount is invested what money is being invested so we have two kind of uh, vargi karan or you can say classification here first is the small scale industry and then we have large scale industry now this money would have changed but uh, as per the text the small scale industry if the investment is up to say 1 crore 1 crore then this industry will be called as small scale if the investment the money being invested is more than 1 crore then we call it as a large scale industry for example small scale industry match making uh, the handicrafts toy plastics containers and other goods when we talk about large scales then the cosmetic drugs electronic items they are generally involve more than 1 crores of investment now who owns it you me uh, the group of a people or the government who owns the who owns the industry so public sector industries are those industries which are owned by the government that is for example bhel bharat heavy electronic limited sale steel authority of india limited national thermal power corporation so all these are being owned by governed by organized by public sector that is public we are public and who is the representative of public it's government central government and the state government then we have private sector private sector means a single person or a group of people like the industrialists they are holding the uh, key or the administration or you can say they are whole soul of these uh, companies like tisco bajaj bpl there are so many examples then we have joint sector when this public and private they combine themselves means they get together they get together and uh, they are they are having stakes on an industry then we call it it as uh, joint sector so like indian oil we have cooperative now here what happens that i am a person i am dealing with milk you are also a person dealing with milk you are producing raw material i am uh, selling it all these people they get together and they make a cooperative so whatever profit i am getting whatever loss i am getting or we are getting we it will be distributed equally the loss also will be distributed equally so this kind of ownership is called cooperative it's called cooperative industry for example sugar industry in maharashtra the coir industry in kerala amul is also the milk one the, it is related to milk is also a cooperative so we talked about uh, classification of industry on the basis of raw material we have agro based and uh, mineral based agro we have cotton wool jute silk textile rubber sugar tea coffee edible oil in mineral we talked about uh, iron and steel cement aluminium machine tools and petrochemicals when it comes to what is the role the basic or the key industry which is supplying the product to the other industry like the iron steel copper smelting aluminium smelting the consumer industry which is providing or giving it to us directly that is sugar toothpaste paper sewing machine and uh, fans what amount is being invested more than 1 crore it's a small scale and it's a no less than 1 crore is small scale and greater than 1 crore it's a large scale on the basis of the ownership we have public sector uh, owned and uh, operated by the government agency bhel sale and private sector like tisco bajaj dabur joint sector they are jointly run by the both the state and the individual that is the government and the private people like oil india limited then not not first not uh, indian oil it's oil india limited 
cooperative sectors, they are producers and suppliers working on the same thing. They get together and the profit and losses they share equally. So this is uh, the classification. So we will start with the agro based industries. Now, as we just saw that the agro based industry means the raw material is coming from the agriculture. It's coming from the agriculture. So let me just take you again back. So agriculture means uh, we just talked about cotton, jute, silk, woolen textiles, sugar, edible oil. These are all based on agriculture industry. So coming from the agriculture basically. So first thing, the first thing is the textile industry. In this, the textile industry becomes very important. Why? We know that most of the people in our country is they are involved in agriculture. This is the first one. So the second number, the second number of employer of the country is textile industry. That is why it is so important. It's textile industry. It is the second largest employer of, after agriculture. And this contributes to around 4% textile industry. It contributes around 4% of the GDP, gross domestic product. Then only industry which is self-reliant means it is producing itself, it is consuming itself. That is, it is not dependent on any other industry. That is the important thing. So the first successful, uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, let, let me just take you to the, the cotton textile saw because this is what is a textile industry. There are certain factors which we need to understand. The textile industry, as we said, it is uh, around 14% significantly because what I'm trying to suggest here is this book is 2003, then it was revised in 2011 like this. So we have and 2008 data is also there. So you'll, you'll find different data in this book. So I just want or request you to Google the latest one. So these numbers may change and we have a very great amount of this 4% GDP is uh, provided by the textile industry and we get 24.6 foreign exchange. Very important. Whatever foreign exchange we are getting around 25% comes from the textile industry from the textile industry and it is the largest employer after the agriculture after the agriculture and as i said the, it is self reliant that means it has a complete chain by itself that is raw materials to the highest value added products it produces and you know it has is hasn't have to depend on any other so i'll just show you the flow here see the fiber production is done so when the raw raw fiber is there the raw fiber, fiber is used for the fiber production. Then the yarn, after spinning we have yarn. Then we have weaving and knitting. Then we make the fabric. This is what we get. And then dyeing, finishing of this weaving, knitting or the fabric you can see. Like this, I, let me tell you. Fiber production, raw fiber, it is spinned. Yarn, yarn will be weaved and knit, uh, knitted. It is fabric, it is dyed and finished. Then we get the garments. This is the final thing. So now coming to the uh, cotton textiles, cotton kapas, cotton is kapas. So this is produced with, uh, it may be hand spinning or an individual may be working in, on it or spinning. The, he may be or she may be using or the electricity. So it is called power looms. So these hand spinning are only called looms while the looms which are using power electricity for their working, they are called power looms. They are hand looms, as I said, these are hand looms and mills also, big, big mills. And they are concentrated in Maharashtra and Gujarat and this maximum production by power looms is done. So power looms are used heavily. We were, with, we were thinking about or you might be thinking about, it might be, you know, the, the cotton textile may be produced more in the mills rather than the power looms. But we have 54.17% of share of production through power looms, power looms. So the first uh, successful textile mill was established in Mumbai in 1854. Textile mill, first textile mill in 1854, where in Mumbai, in Mumbai. So as per the text, there are nearly 16 uh, 100 cotton human made fiber textiles in our country and about 80% of these are by private sector 
and most of the textile mills as i just said that there are there is a belt cotton belt where cotton is grown black mitti black uh, soil where we have maharashtra and gujarat and the most important thing is that raw cotton market transport all these port facilities they have port also bandarga port facilities labor the climate is also moist all these are very important factors for why these cotton textiles are mostly concentrated in maharashtra and gujarat maharashtra and gujarat and this industry is not only for fabric the other people there are so many people which are involved and like the the packagers like the dyers like the chemical you know supporting people mill stores engineering works they also get job from this this particular industry okay now coming to the one more aspect is hand spun this hand spun khadi khadi is very you know it was made by famous by mahatma gandhi it was already there but this hand spun khadi it also provides a large scale employment to weavers mainly the people who are working in their home in their cottage industry in their cottage industry so india has the large second largest uh, installed capacity of spindles after china so what is this spindle spindle is like this and the the dhaga like the thread is like this you know when the thread is being made they are they are kept in the spindle so this is what we are talking about but before that let me tell you one more thing that india export yarn this yarn yarn means it is not uh, it is already been made into the threads and these thread thread you know combined thread or you can say a collection of thread is called as a yarn so this yarn is what we are exporting it to japan and we are also spend as you know exporting it to uh, usa uk russia france east european countries nepal singapore sri lanka and various other african countries so india accounts for one fourth of the total world trade in cotton yarn so one thing is very important coming here cotton yarn we are always talking about the yarn that is the dhaga that is the thread so we have one fourth we are one fourth that is 25% of whole world complete world the world trade of yarn cotton yarn is by us 25% let me just take you here because there are certain things we need we just need to discuss so what happens that the yarn we are the yarn we are very good in but we are not very good in the textile textile in fact india has the largest uh, installed capacity of spindle after china you know so why we are very good in yarn and why we are not very good in textiles because if you talk about a very small country which is just next to us it is bangladesh it is bangladesh and bangladesh is the is quite ahead of us when it comes to textile but we are good at yarn why because the the problem is that uh, the textile or the facilitation of textile in our country is not that good is not that good that is the yarn can be produced if we have very good infrastructure and people are involved in this but we are not very good in textiles okay so as i gave the example of bangladesh it is you know way ahead of us in terms of textiles in fact it is number 1 i guess i'll take, give you one more example the yarn or dhaga or the thread it is sold 85 rupees or it may have might have changed i'm just giving you an example just say it is being spent it is being sold at 85 per kg but when it comes to a textile or a fabric or a pant or a shirt then this is sold at 800 rupees per kg you can see the difference that where we are lagging because of the textile we are not producing we are only going for the yarn okay so i have to just take you to this uh, places where we have cotton textile woolen textile and silk textile so where they are concentrated let us see okay so here we have the cotton textiles if you see these are the cotton textiles these these are uh, round or you can say the spheres or dark circles these are the places where we have cotton um, textiles as i said as i said 
Maharashtra and Gujarat have most of them. But we have other places also. Then we have woolen textile. So woolen will be always, you know, on these places. Why? Because wool, wool is normally you know, taken out from sheep, etc. These are the, the, they always live or stay in a cold environment. So this is the place where the cold environment is there. So wool, woolen textile mills are mostly concentrated here, but it is still here. Some, some places you will find other, other region also. Then the silk textile, silk uh, comes from the silk worm, it's a cocoon and uh, mulberry trees it grows. So silk comes from uh, various places and mostly, you know, these are the places, uh, Kerala and, you know, South India, we have these places. Then we have here also in uh, Bengal some places. And if you go up, we, we are very fond of the shawls and, uh, you know, the dharis of Jammu Kashmir, so Baramula, Srinagar, Anantanag, they are also providing very good silk textile. Coming to jute textile, textiles, these are jute, that means patsan we call in Hindi, jute textiles. So India is the largest producer of raw jute. Please understand, India is the largest producer of what? Jute, raw jute. And second largest exporter after Bangladesh. Second largest exporter after Bangladesh. Let me take you to jute uh, textiles. So, as we suggested that there are 70, 70 jute mills in India because the number might have changed. But this gives you an idea. But these are mainly along these banks of Hooghly River. So, there is a Hooghly River here. And there is a very narrow, narrow belt. The narrow belt is just 3 km. The width is 3 km. And the length is just from here to here. It is 98 km, this place. Now, why this uh, only this place is responsible for providing most of the jute? First of all, it is very near to the jute producing areas. And there is a uh, transport that is inexpensive, somewhat water transport. And there is a good uh, railway network supported by. And uh, waterways, the raw mills can move to the mills. And water, because this uh, needs a lot of water. So abundance of water is there and mostly because it is uh, near Bihar etc means the UP areas, these areas. So you get very good labor here. That is cheap labor from Bihar, Odisha and Uttar Pradesh and Kolkata itself. So that is how this uh, jute textiles and production is more here. The first ju jute mill, it was set up near Kolkata in 1859. Jute first mill 1859 in Rishra, Rishra, okay. But what happened after the partition, because Bangladesh went away, the Pakistan also was uh, in the partition. So the, the thing was that three-fourth of the jute producing area went to Bangladesh. That is why the uh, we are the second largest exporter after Bangladesh, because most of the jute went to Bangladesh, right. And this jute industry, it supports 2.61 lakh workers directly and 40 lakhs who are directly or indirectly, you can say, small and marginal farmers. They are also involved in production of jute and mesta. This is also one of the kind of jute. But as we said, we have some uh, problems also here that the synthetic fibers or synthetic substitutes are coming. And Bangladesh, of course, is our greatest uh, competitor with Brazil, Philippines, Egypt also, Thailand. They are also producing and exporting a good deal of uh, jute, right? Then we had a policy in 2005. The 2005 policy, government made a policy that is called the National Jute Policy. And this was the main objective or the idea was to increase the production of jute, also improve the quality and then the farmer should get the good prices and they must enhance the production per hectare. So what are the main markets for this jute we have? We have USA, we have Canada and Russia, United States, uh, United, sorry, United States of America we already talked about, U, UAR, that is United Arab Republic, all the Arabian countries you can say, most of them and UK and Australia, okay. Now coming to the sugar industry, 
the sugar industry india is again the second largest producer we are always first second or third you know we are always in this league so we are second largest producer of sugar which we, which is the first one it's brazil it's brazil but when we talk about gud and khansari these are also a kind of production like sugar which comes from sugar cane so it's a different kind kind of sugar you can say but it is mostly used in the in the rural part of india so india is the largest producer of gud and khansari this you have to remember we are the largest producer of gud and khansari and sugar mills are mostly located in up bihar maharashtra karnataka tamil nadu andhra pradesh and gujarat so mostly we will find it in up and because uh, the ganna or the sugar cane which which the southern india has they are they have more sucrose they are more sweet that is why this uh, industry is going to the south also it is blooming in the south also so most mills they are in the cooperative sector this is a very important uh, you can say it idea about mills of sugar they are mostly cooperative sectors so in all we have around uh, you know it, you can just take a number you can it may change so it, there we have around 460 sugar mills and as i said mostly in uttar pradesh because the sucrose content in the down that is the down south it's good that is why it is also going up and as i suggested around 60% is is in uttar pradesh and bihar most of the sugar mills are in uttar pradesh and bihar only and they are cooperative sector and again we have the same challenges for this uh, sugar industry is also first of all the old and the trivial and the inefficient methods are still used in this and because this sugar cane industry or sugar industry is very very important thing it is seasonal it's seasonal 6 to 8 weeks it 6 uh, to 8 months it take for the sugar cane to grow so it's kind of uh, you know seasonal so mostly people are not interested that is why this is a this is a those who are working they are working but uh, because it is seasonal so people want a you know 12 month job that's that's how 12 12 months kind of crop production they want and the transport delay is also there and then the baggies what is the baggies the baggies is uh, when you take out the you can say content from the sugar cane the remaining thing is called baggies right so this is not utilized uh, very efficiently or for some any purpose in, in india this is the problem now we come to the mineral uh, based industry now these industry require what they require the mineral as the input okay so these industry they use minerals and metals as raw material so whatever is coming as a raw material they are minerals or they are metals so this is the basic thing about this then we have the iron and steel industry one of the most important industry here so basic industry iron in steel industry is a basic industry because this industry provides the raw material to any other industry so it's kind of basic industry then this steel consists of what it consists of iron ore cooking coal and limestone that is we need if we want to make a steel we need iron ore cooking coal and limestone in the ratio of 4 is to 2 is to 1 that is 4 out of 7 is iron ore 2 out of 7 is cooking coal and 1 out, out of 7 proportion is limestone this is how steel is formed so india is the ninth largest steel producer we are ninth here ninth and india is the largest producer of one of the kind of iron which is very kind of you can say spongy it's sponge iron so we are the largest in sponge iron and there are 10 primary steel plants in india there are many because you know the plants are coming up and we have major plants and they are doing the production like the bukharo the raurkela the burnpur bhilai durgapur this these names are quite famous and steel authority of india limited because steel authority of india limited that means it's a government employ uh, this enterprise so this is the nodal marketing agency of steel produced by the public sector undertaking so public sector means it belong belongs to the government and uh, mostly the area the region of if you see bukharo raurkela all these areas are situated or located in the chota nagpur plateau region 
because they get the raw materials easily from there. So today we have around 32.8 million tons of steel production and we rank 9th and uh, if you see that large quantity of production of steel per capita consumption uh, per annum is only 32 kg. This is an alarming situation but this might have changed. You have to see that what is the present scenario. So how is the steel produced? Now let us have a look on how the steel is produced. First of all, the raw material is received at a plant that is the transportation has to be done. Then in the blast furnace, the iron ore is melted. Then limestone is fluxing material which is added to the iron ore. Then whatever uh, dirt or slag is there, it is being removed. And now coke is burned to heat the ore. So now heating is been done. So when heating is done, we get molten iron. So pig iron we call it as. The molten mat matrix or you can say the the molten which uh, we got from the burning of coke, this is put in molds so that it takes shape. So that is called as pigs. Then the steel is made. Pig iron is again then purified. So we use some process like melting and oxidation or oxidizing the impurities. And then we add manganese, nickel and chromium. This gives that strength to the steel. And finally, with various machines, etc., we give rolling, pressing and casting and forging to give shape to the metal. Now coming to the aluminium, the aluminium basically comes from bauxite. bauxite. Bauxite is the ore of aluminium. So aluminium is uh, why we are discussing it. It is quite light. Uh, like iron because iron oxidizes very easily. It is corrosion free. So erosion and corrosion does not play, take place here so easily. And it is good conductor of heat. It is a very good conductor of heat. Then it is used in because it is light and all these qualities are there. So it is used in aircrafts, utensils and wire industry also. And we have various uh, smelting plants in India. Nalco and Balco, this, these are in Odisha, Nalco and Balco for example. So coming to the chemical industry, this chemical industry means all the chemicals which we produce, it contributes to 3% of the GDP. Then we are third largest in India as far as chemical industries are concerned and this can be, this chemical can be divided into the inorganic chemicals and organic chemicals. Inorganic and organic that is you can say carbonic and acarbonic. So content of carbon is there that is we call as petrochemicals, dyes and drugs. These are organic chemicals and then we have inorganic chemicals like the sulfuric acid, plastics, adhesives and paints. So these are the areas of iron and steel plant if you see from here. We have uh, Burnpur, Durgapur, Bukaro, Jamshedpur, Raurkela, then Bhilai, Vijayanagar, Bhadravati and Salem. These are the main key areas. There are many but these are the main key areas. So we were talking about uh, this earlier the Steel Authority of India. This is a government undertaking. We have TISCO also. T-I-S-C-O. TISCO is Tata Iron and Steel Company. So this is a, this is not a government enterprise. This is a, this is the private enterprise. And it started way back when we were, you know, under the British regime. I'll give you an idea. What happened to the, this uh, quantity of steel in 1950s, China and India, they were producing same. Means we were at par with China. And now China is the, largest consumer of uh, steel and it is the largest producer also. Please understand China is the largest producer, it is largest consumer also. And it just went up to, you know, in 2004, India was the largest exporter of steel. In 2004. And uh, China just overpowered us and Chota Nagpur Plateau region, as I said, it is the maximum, uh, the maximum, uh, the industries are there only. And the idea is that in this place, Chota Nagpur Plateau, we get uh, the iron with low cost, high rate of the high grade of raw material is uh, easily available, the cheap labor and also the vast growth potential in the home market. This is what, this is how we get the most of the situated, located uh, industries are there. Now coming to, I, I have to discuss one more thing here before I just go to this fertilizer industry. Now coming to aluminium smelting as we were talking about, 
एल्यूमिनियम स्मेल्टिंग इज द सेकेंड एल्यूमिनियम स्मेल्टिंग मीन्स गेटिंग आउट ऑफ एल्यूमिनियम और फाइंडिंग द एल्यूमिनियम फ्रॉम द बॉक्साइड ओर सो दिस एल्यूमिनियम स्मेल्टिंग इज द सेकेंड मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट मेटलर्जिकल इंडस्ट्री इन इंडिया वाई एल्यूमिनियम इज सो इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज इट इज लाइट इट इज रेजिस्टेंट टू क्रोजन एंड इट इज अ गुड कंडक्टर ऑफ हीट मेलिएबल एंड डक्टाइल दैट मीन्स इट कैन बी फॉर्म इन शीट्स एंड वायर कैन बी मेड आउट ऑफ इट एंड अदर मेटेरियल कैन बी एडेड दैट इज वाई इट इज वाइडली यूज इन मैन्युफैक्चर एयरक्राफ्ट और मैन्युफैक्चरिंग ऑफ एयरक्राफ्ट यूटेंसिल्स एंड वायर्स एंड दिस इज वाई बिकॉज ऑफ दीज प्रॉपर्टीज इट इज अ गुड सब्सटीट्यूट ऑफ कॉपर जिंक लेड इन नंबर ऑफ इंडस्ट्रीज so there are eight aluminium smelting plants in the country located in odisha odisha we have nalco and balco then we have west bengal then west bengal and then kerala and uttar pradesh and chatisgarh then we have maharashtra and tamil nadu so if we talk about uh, the numbers in 2004 india produced over 600 million million tons of aluminium and bauxite is the raw material from which this smelting is done right and uh, this is a flow chart let us see that how this is being manufactured and we have certain problems also like the you know the regular supply of electricity if it is assured and the raw material cost is minimum then we can again this aluminum smelting is is a very prosperous and very good we can say industry in india so first of all we need to understand the ratio between the ores and aluminum that is 4 to 6 tons of bauxite 2 tons of alumina alumina and then we get 1 ton of aluminum so from here we get 1 ton of aluminum so the process of manufacturing of aluminum industry in this the raw material is the bauxite so we we get bauxite quarry and this is transported by rail or ship to actual location and here alumina that is in aluminum refinery the bauxite is crushed with alumina dissolved out this alumina is dissolved out then the aluminum smelter we get in this smelting we we put the cryolite which act as an as an electrolyte electrolyte where two two electrodes are being placed and one of the electrode will take the aluminum so this is how we smelt this is called the smelting of aluminum now we talked about the chemical industry also so as i said that this uh, constitutes 3% of the gdp and we can divide this chemical industry product into inorganic and organic this inorganic uh, chemicals have include the sulfuric acid mostly we use this to manufacture the fertilizers synthetic fibers plastic adhesive paints and dye stuffs uh, nitric acid the alkalis soda ash this is used soda ash is used to make the glass the soaps and detergents right see organic chemicals we have petrochemicals and uh, which are widely used for making of synthetic fibers synthetic rubber plastics dye stuffs drugs and pharmaceuticals coming to the fertilizers uh, fertilizer industry this industry manufactures nitrogenous uh, which contains nitrogen this nitrogen fertilizers urea phosphoric uh, the fertilizers ammonium phosphate we call it as dap and uh, then we have certain complex fertilizers so india is the third largest producer of these nitrogenous fertilizers we are third in this and these uh, industries are located in gujarat up tamil nadu punjab and kerala so this uh, fertilizers industry we were talking about as we just said that uh, the production of nitrogen uh, fertilizers which is mainly urea then phosphatic fertilizers ammonium phosphate complex fertilizers and this complex fertilizer is is essentially the combination of nitrogen phosphate and potash so npk nitrogen potash and uh, the phosphate and potash this is called the complex fertilizers the third one which is the potash is, we don't have uh, the reserves that much reserves of this potash so we generally import it and we are the third largest producer of nitrogenous uh, fertilizers there are 57 fertilizers unit which are uh, producing this nitrogenous and complex that is npk nitrogenous fertilizers 29 for urea 9 for ammonium phosphate uh, as a by product so in some industry the ammonium phosphate is not the main product which we want it is a by product so this is also being used and we have 68 other uh, very small units 
to produce single super phosphate so we have 10 public sector undertakings that is the government sector and one cooperative sector at uh, hazira in gujarat under the fci that is fertilizer corporation of india fertilization corporation of india so these are the places where this uh, took place or this is taking place fertilizer industry then coming to the cement industry so cement is uh, manufactured from limestone silica aluminium and gypsum so again cement is uh, you know using lot of heavy things like limestone silica aluminium and gypsum and mostly the cement industry is located in gujarat and the first cement plant was in chennai it was established in chennai in 1904 and this cement is widely exported to gulf countries africa and south asia so what we were talking about is this cement is very important as far as we build houses factories bridges etc roads airports dams all the commercial establishment we use this cement industry so it required certain bulky heavy raw materials as i just suggested we have limestone silica aluminium and gypsum and also coal and electric power is uh, employed and they are these industries are mostly strategically located in gujarat because for the Gulf countries, it is a suitable way, you know, you can say transport and also access. First cement plant was in Chennai in 1904. Okay. So we have certain plants, as we said, there are 128 large plants, and then we have 332 mini plants in the country. And uh, then we are the exporter to East Asia, Middle East, Africa, South Asia. These are the places where we are exporting then coming to the automobile industry this automobile industry all of the vehicles which we know today we are the developers we may make it we make it because what happened after the liberalization there was a policy in 1991 and this uh, liberalization allowed the companies different companies the giants the giant in the automobile industry to enter the indian market so there was a FDI for uh, the foreign direct investment it happened so all the cars etc and the parts they are being made in India now this FDI as I said FDI this bought new technology also and new ways also that is how we got the global developments and there are 15 manufacturers of passenger cars multi uh, multi utility vehicles and co for commercial vehicles nine are there 14 for two and three wheelers and we are the place where we find these automobile industries and these places are or these industries are located mainly in Delhi, Gurgaon, Mumbai, Pune, Chennai, Kolkata, Lucknow, Indore, Hyderabad, Jamshedpur and Bangalore. Then the information industry and electronic industry. Now this is very important. The electronic industry if you talk about a transistor or you go up to a television uh, or the telephone you have in your hand this the uh, telephone exchange, the radars, computers, and all the equipments which in which involve electronics or the telecommunication industry, we are making it. Means Bangalore is the hub, or you can call the Bangalore is the hub of electronic, uh, cap or you can it is called as an electronic capital also and software capital also. Okay, there are other places also where electronic goods are being uh, you know say uh, produced, which are Mumbai, Delhi, Hyderabad, Pune, Chennai, Kolkata, Lucknow, and Coimbatore. So we have number of software STPI, software technology parks, when we talk about the information technology and uh, the major impact of this industry is employment generation and the IT industry employed in this 2005 year running in 2019. So there are so many people who are employed here and 30% of them are women and this is a very good thing. 30% are women and this industry, the IT industry is the major foreign uh, getting getting industry and then we have bpos also so this is the it industry which is the most important industry right now we have this is the example of just a picture of cable manufacturing facilities at hcl uh, west bengal group narayanpur and this is the gas turbine rotor and assembly bed at bhl now with all this industry comes the pollution so industrial pollution and environmental degradation is uh, the major concern when we talk about any kind of industry so industries causes four types of pollution the land pollution the air pollution the water pollution the noise pollution 
and how to control this we'll just talk about this first of all let us see that this land pollutions because land get polluted and the soil quality is degrading when the lot of industrial waste all the toxic waste they are dumped just ruthlessly rendering the soil becoming unfertile and what happens to air because we we can live without water we can live without food for many days but we cannot live without air so the emission of toxic gas like the carbon monoxide sulfur dioxide uh, these are very harmful because this is coming from industries from vehicle and this cause irrepar irreparable damage irreparable damage to, to the body and though think about the newborns the smoke which is emitted by these industries and factory they contain very small small dust particles and that is how the pulmonary uh, problems and diseases asthma etc the human beings are facing right now coming to water the again untreated uh, industrial waste and chemical effluents or chemical toxic materials they are just discharged in water and the the aquatic life is is uh, suffering from this but all the all the uh, flora and fauna which are dependent on this water will be will is, is, their life is in geopardize and then they are unfit for human use also one more thing if you are sleeping and someone starts drilling you will not be able to sleep that is the noise pollution so the blaring horns of the automobiles noise of machinery in the in the factories large scale construction activities creates lot of noise pollution and that's that cause irritation that cause uh, bp blood pressure and deafness also so now it becomes very important for us to handle and control this environmental uh, degradation we need to minimize the use of water we have to do certain things i'll just tell you what we can do because there is an example also so before that let me just show you the stpi we were talking about software technology parks so mainly we are talking to you, we were talking about uh, bangalore hyderabad the noida uh, delhi and uh, then we have gurgaon jaipur gandhinagar indore bhubneshwar kolkata visakhapatnam mumbai pune pune is also a hub and mysore chennai tiruvananthapuram then shrinagar also somewhat and mohali guwahati also we have stpis so these uh, pollution and mostly one more pollution is there that the hot water when in uh, say in thermal plant we have hot water that produces steam and that produces electricity so this hot water very hot very hot water is just dumped into the water bodies and when this hot water comes this the water bodies or the water aquatic life how it is going to suffer it's so hot one one bucket of uh, say the or one proportion of bad water it creates it it uh, degrades eight per eight uh, you can say content of the water so this is how just uh, you can say the boond or the drop of toxicity can also create a lot of problem then we have to control the environmental degradation this kind of uh, pollution which i was saying was the thermal pollution thermal pollution is the water which we without even handling them or cooling them we are just sending into it into the water so what is the idea or the key way of handling this first we have to minimize the use of water we cannot just throw water and just get it again from somewhere else and just start using it we need to reuse and recycle the water the harvesting of rain water should be done and the hot water which is going directly into the aquatic life or anywhere has to be stopped we need to clean we need to treat it make we need to reuse it or rather we need to cool it before sending it to anywhere and same goes with the uh, you know chemical things which are coming out we need to treat them so these are all the ways which we can uh, do to minimize this uh, environmental degradation just to you know mention that ntpc has showed certain things it is ios it has award iso certification for ems and ems stands for environmental management system which is which comes under 14001 and ntpc has all done various things if you see here they have done various things like like they have utilized optimally the equipment latest techniques upgrading the existing equipment also the ash utilization is you can say waste generation is minimum uh, the waste generation uh, is minimized and then the green belts you see here the green belts are also being created and environmental pollution they have created ash pond management ash water the recycling and also ecological monitoring reviews and online database management is done in the power stations so ntpc has set an example this is what we have to do in order to get 
this thing under control which is all kind of pollution and degradation which is taking place because of the industries. So this is all about this topic. Thank you so much and take care of yourself.